Well, good morning and uh, welcome to day two of Ascend. Uh, I know yesterday was pretty action-packed and I think today will be too. I know it was uh, tough going in between sessions because there was so much to choose from yesterday. Um, I know I really like the diverse dozen in the morning and some of the ones, the ones that are in this room will be recorded and then you'll be able to access those uh, maybe today, I think, but sometime, you know, certainly before the conference is over. So at least that's one option I wanted to point out to you. Um, I know that was pretty cool, the Vulcan flying. Uh, I really enjoyed AC's microtrends. That was a very thought-provoking one that he had yesterday afternoon. Um, and then the, the kind of cool one with the, the lunar rover, the, uh, what was that one, the nuclear-based well, whatever, it, you know, I think it was the one where they had the simulated game and the, the rover was going around showing you what everything would look like on a moon base, where I thought that was a really cool way to, uh, to you know, kind of underscore what some of the challenges are at a higher level, but know that the analysis was behind it because, you know, that was reflected in some of the comments and discussions. So I thought that was a really interesting way to do a, um, to do a session. So that's one of the neat things about Ascend is we're trying all kinds of different ways of of doing these kind of panels and sessions to just um, explore what's possible. So hopefully some of you enjoyed that and I hope today will be a good day for you. So I'd first like to start off today with another award. It's an honor to celebrate excellence again today, you know, with uh, one of these. And I'd like to invite Stefan Blanchett, director of AIAA's Space and Missile System Group to the stage to present, to present today's award. Okay, Stefan. <clears throat> okay, it's my pleasure to announce the 2024 AIAA Space Systems Award. This award recognizes outstanding achievements in the architecture, analysis, design, and implementation of space systems. The 2024 AIAA Space Systems Award is presented to the team from the DART team, is, is presented to the team from the DART team at John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Here with us today are Elizabeth Congdon and Jeffrey Ottman. The citation. Yeah. I'll get the timing right next time. Okay, for outstanding achievement in the development and operation of the DART spacecraft, completing humanity's first in space demonstration of planetary defense technology. Congratulations. Thank you guys. That was such a cool mission too. I don't know if you guys watched some of the graphics there. That was, uh, you know, the company I used to work for built some of the systems that went on that and that was really neat to see that come to fruition. Okay, turning to today's program, we, we certainly have a lot, or not just this session, but the overall day. We have a lot of sessions and topics for you to choose from again, but I wanna point out just a few. What I did wanna thank those of you who voted for Astro Debates. The uh, topics, um, we have two topics for today that'll be in this room. It's the preference of human space exploration to robotic space exploration. So that'll be a pretty lively debate, I would guess. And then whether or not the moon should be the next destination for human exploration. So um, if you haven't, you know, I know we have a lot going on in the schedule. This is a really fun format. So if you get a chance, please poke your head and spend some time listening to those debates. It should be, it should be pretty fun and, and also very informative. We have the Pickering lecture, lecture today at 12. Again, on this stage, get your lunch. Again, similar to yesterday, there'll be lunches available in the expo hall. And you come back in here to listen to Bonnie Berati, Deputy Program Scientist for the Europa Clipper mission and tell us much more about NASA's first detailed exploration of an ocean world. Also, another interesting thing, uh, it'll be a unique session. Uh, because Aviation and Ascend are together, we're gonna have a um, chance to hear from NASA's chief technologist, A.C. Charania, and 10 NASA center chief technologists, all discussing technology maturation and infusion. So it'll be a blend of technologies across uh, both space and aviation. And that's at 3.30 in the Academy Ballroom, 421. So I think that's more toward the other end of the building. And please, tonight, we have the Aero and Space the opening reception in Expo Hall at six o'clock. 
Um, attendees and speakers from both the SEND and Aviation will be there, and it's a great opportunity to network. Should be, should be nice and packed. Um, so anyway, a lot to do today. And again, use your app. It'll help you find things. I know I was scrolling through mine most of yesterday, but you can also read all the little signs on the doors, too. OK, so for today and this macro, uh, we're going to set the tone for the day by dive, diving deeper into the concept of why a nation shouldn't or can't shoulder the risk on its own as we're doing space missions. International collaboration is key to a prosperous space ecosystem. Uh, the way we've set today up is we'll have a keynote speaker, and then we'll, it'll be followed by a panel, and then we will leave some time for questions at the end. I think you have the voting QR codes for the questions. Uh, so I'll try to leave at least five to seven minutes for questions at the end. <clears throat> Our keynote speaker and panel will discuss how Artemis Accords are influencing global, global cooperation and competition, and how these dynamics are driving the development of a sustainable cislunar economy. They'll talk about the innovative business models poised to advance space development and create new opportunities. To begin with, I'd like to introduce Carol, Karen Feldstein, NASA Associate Administrator for International and Interagency Relations. Karen leads NASA's international and interagency activities and partnerships, coordinates with US executive branch offices, departments, and agencies such as National Security Council, National Space Council, Departments of State and Defense, administers NASA's Export Control Program, supports NASA's highest level external advisory councils. It's what a cool job. I mean, she's got to be really busy right now. So please welcome Karen Feldstein to the stage for a keynote. Good morning. Thank you, Julie. It really is a pleasure to see so many old friends and new entrants to space here for Ascend. As Julie said, we're going to talk this morning about the intersection of international relations, international cooperation, and the space and economy in a way a microcosm of this entire conference this week. This topic is also precisely what's on the tongues of national leaders and legislators around the world when they talk to NASA. Meeting us at the Casa Rosada in Buenos Aires, at the Elysee in Paris, in the Presidential Palace in Mexico City, or Parliament in London. They talk about strengthening their economies, growing their space sectors, and meeting national and societal objectives through space investments. All want to drive towards a thriving, highly capable space industry. For some nations, that means buying capability from US industry and learning as they go. For others, serving as suppliers or partners to US industry. And still others prefer to build entirely indigenous capabilities. But there's room for partnership in all of these models. And for our most traditional longstanding partners, it means innovating in our government to government and industry-to-industry industry collaborations. Just last week in Japan, for example, we discussed the 10-year multi-billion dollar space strategy fund established in April to support private companies in Japan in developing space technology. In its press release announcing the fund, the government of Japan asserted that in addition to the rapid expansion in market size for space-related industries, the initiative for space development, they said, is shifting from the public sector to the private sector in many countries around the world. Let me repeat that. The initiative for space development shifting to the private sector. This is Japan positioning for the future. And here this morning on the panel, you'll hear from Jay Kim of Boryang. Listen for how the private sector is helping to lead in Korea just as their new space agency is getting underway. Governments are beginning to position for these shifts in different ways. About a year and a half ago, French President Emmanuel Macron came to NASA during his official state visit to Washington. He had discussions in our Space Operations Center. He joked around with French astronaut Thomas Pesquet about which of them is more popular. Then he stopped by the conference room 
where NASA and the Department of Commerce were hosting a separate session for US and French companies to share their respective capabilities and interests. President Macron pulled up a chair and sat down for another hour and a half, completely upending his tightly scripted presidential schedule, just fascinated by the prospects he was hearing to enhance industry to industry space cooperation between our countries. So it used to be that governments talked about international cooperation and companies were guided by those government to government arrangements in their subcontracts. But the nature of international cooperation is certainly changing for governments and for industry in a foundational way. In this new era where we speak openly about soft power and space diplomacy, this and other government to government space dialogues are not only a reflection of the important role that space plays in strong and resilient bilateral foreign relations, but also the importance of industry to industry cooperation in achieving these same objectives. The track 1.5, they call them, I don't know why, uh, industry sessions are increasingly uh, an integral part of these US conversations with key allies and partners. And of course, no one knows better than the people in this room how private ventures are beginning to mimic the same strong relationships as government-led programs, a nascent but very significant evolution. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. First, let me go back and just give a little context of the importance of international collaboration and partnerships to NASA's mission. Our history of international cooperation dates back to the very beginning for NASA, and it continues to grow as more and more countries invest in space. We're working with 130 countries on more than 700 active projects spanning the entire breadth of the agency's portfolio. About half of these projects have historically been with other highly capable space nations. In fact, only about nine countries have accounted for half our active international agreements. Australia, Canada, the European Space Agency, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Korea, and the United Kingdom. But the proliferation of new space agencies and national space programs is leading to significant growth in cooperation with emerging space partners at varying degrees of plans and capabilities. And we are absolutely breaking new ground. Earlier this year, NASA and the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center announced that the United Arab Emirates will provide an airlock for the Gateway, joining the US, Canada, Japan and Europe, all of whom, as you know, have decades of working together already on the International Space Station. This game changer is a remarkable achievement for the UAE and a great step forward in the partnerships forming around lunar exploration. And speaking of the moon, in April we signed the first agreement in history for human spaceflight cooperation on the lunar surface a major milestone in the US civil space program, followed by the announcement by our national leaders that the first non-American to walk on the moon will be an astronaut from Japan. This agreement for Japan to provide a pressurized rover and to receive two flight opportunities to the moon followed years of technical discussions and is a huge feat for space diplomacy. And of course, the huge story earlier this year, seeing NASA's first commercial lunar payload services missions take flight, a program enabling commercial access to the moon, not only by the United States, but so many other nations. Meanwhile, we have enormous momentum building through the Artemis Accords. Inspired by the Artemis program, the Accords are a set of principles based on the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and other already existing legal regimes that reflect our core belief at NASA that how we go back to the moon and later to Mars is as important as what we will do. The Accords are a commitment. They're not a cooperation agreement. They are a political commitment to the collective values that we take with us into the cosmos to ensure peaceably 
and transparently to render aid, to ensure unfettered access to scientific data that all of humanity can learn from, to ensure that one's activities do not interfere with those of others, to preserve our heritage, and to develop best practices and rules for how we conduct trailblazing activities like extraction of space resources. At NASA and for our partners at the State Department, we believe these principles should be compelling to everyone. And accordingly, the community of signatories is growing faster and faster. While the actual number is not the point, but yes, it's 43 countries, we are a geographically diverse and inclusive group, now representing every continent, that is taking on the most pressing issues of our time related to space exploration. And Julie, since you asked me yesterday, the most recent to sign was Armenia, but there have been 10 in 2024 so far, growing our community by more than 30%. After Angola closed us out last year, we've seen Belgium, Uruguay, and Greece, Slovenia, Switzerland, and Sweden, I think all in the same week, Slovakia, Lithuania, Peru, and again, most recently, Armenia became the 43rd, 43rd country. And a number of other countries are in the wings, waiting their signing opportunity. But these are unilateral signings. We come together, we celebrate it, but all countries sign alone and join this community of fellow signatories who have done the same. It is not a bilateral agreement with the United States, which is fitting since we developed the accords and signed initially with seven other nations nearly four years ago. The motivations for these countries to sign are telling. Greece's foreign minister called the accords a beacon of collaboration and, and cooperation among nations. Minister Stoicheva of Bulgaria said that expanding boundaries of human exploration in space will ensure peaceful coexistence on Earth. Indian Ambassador Santu said, exploration is a catalyst in advancing the betterment of humanity. These are the future actors today or well into the future who will be present with us in LEO and in deep space. While the rapidly growing number of Artemis Accords signatories has been surprising, what is ever more so is how deeply the community building around Artemis cares about how to implement the Accords. The signatories are speaking regularly at leadership level about important issues that need to be addressed to create the environment for exploration that we all want to see. And some of the most vocal participants in these discussions have focused the conversations on the needs of countries whose space programs are still developing or who may not be showing up with missions until a decade or more into the future. The work is hard and we're making progress through meaningful results-oriented dialogue. For example, we're beginning to agree on measures we can take today to avoid interference with one another's near-term activities on the moon. This includes something as simple as defining the information our respective, on, uh, defining the information on our respective lunar missions that we intend to report to the United Nations, which is an obligation under Article 11 of the Outer Space Treaty, it says that states will inform the United Nations of the nature, conduct, locations, and results of their space activities. What does that look like? What should we include? What standard do we want to set for others who may not be as transparent? Other topics identified for potential near-term work include interoperability, dissemination of scientific results, and beginning to think about how we might best protect human heritage on the moon. Industry considerations have been lurking in the background of these discussions and at the table right from the outset. How can these high-level principles add clarity or certainty about our future in space? How might interoperability, for example, advance commercial interests? And what opportunities will accrue from any of these outcomes? And these interests are broadening into existing international forums. 
It was always envisioned that the Accords were a starting point, a beginning of the conversation that would feed into some appropriate multilateral body, like the UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or COPUS. And in June, COPUS member states formed a three-year action team on lunar activities consultation, or ATLAC for acronym lovers, to consider the possibility of an international mechanism for consultation and coordination of lunar activities. Is the work of the Artemis Accord signatories duplicative with these formal bodies? I think of it as preparatory. These discussions in the UN will take years. And of course, they're never free from broader geopolitical issues occurring here on Earth. The dialogue among accord signatories is deliberately informal. It's, we created a safe space to brainstorm and exchange views that can later inform official national positions. But as one participating head of a space agency summed it up after one of these gatherings, the soul of these meetings is like a campfire discussion among friends of how things should be and how to make it so. In addition to our joint progress in these implementation discussions, we've learned that signing the Artemis Accords can result in tangible outcomes at the national level for many countries. For example, Bahrain, developing a strategic plan for space exploration and a national space law. Korea announcing its national vision and roadmap for the country's space economy and establishing the Korean space agency, CASA, just a couple of months ago. A big budget boost for Poland's five-year space program, including a national lunar orbiter mission to map lunar mineral deposits. And Rwanda developing a 10 year space policy and strategy for socioeconomic development. These concrete outcomes driving nations to consider how they will explore and shaping that future together, they're creating rich opportunities for the private sector to capitalize on this environment that is supportive and harmonized for future exploration. And as far as cooperation goes, our intention remains that the Artemis program will be the largest global coalition of space partners in history. We're already building international partnerships for Artemis, of course. For the first time, NASA using a European-built system to power an American spacecraft with the European Service Module. Talk about the critical path. And the very first crewed Artemis mission includes, among its crew of four, a partner astronaut. Across the board, established space agencies have significantly increased their investments in space over the last couple of years in human and robotic exploration, and emerging partners are equally enthused, poised to take advantage of opportunities for participation at every level. In fact, the international community has taken an active role in defining NASA's overall approach to Moon to Mars exploration. Together with NASA's workforce and our commercial partners, our international partners help shape NASA's Moon to Mars objectives for science, transportation and habitation, lunar and Mars infrastructure and operations that will shape investments in exploration for years to come. And if I can switch to low Earth orbit for just a moment, our international partners will have that same voice as we establish our strategy for LEO where the prospects for widespread international collaboration seem limitless. In the first 25 years of ISS operations, 273 astronauts from 21 countries served aboard, and nearly 120 countries participated through science or other activities on the ISS. So as we think about transitioning to a commercial LEO environment, NASA is again using a, rigor a rigorous systems engineering process, like for the Moon to Mars objectives, to define specific goals and objectives for its LEO strategy. But there's a crucial difference. For the Moon to Mars objectives, international cooperation was taken as a given. It's what's called a recurring tenant in the architecture that shows how we will uh, operate on our Moon to Mars plans and work together with other nations to implement our mutual goals for sustainable exploration of the Moon and later Mars. 
In contrast, for Leo, we will be explicit in laying out international objectives for a post-ISS Leo environment with specific goals to ensure that we preserve what we hold most dear from the ISS era, most notably the relationships we've built, the trust we've established, the interoperability and technical harmony we have achieved. What will be different, however, will be the connection points between governments and the industries of our respective nations. So back to Artemis. Clearly, our rich history of 65 years of international cooperation at NASA is only the beginning. We are all evolving in this next era of exploration we call the Artemis generation. And with that has come a new era of international space diplomacy and cooperation. There's a story I love to share about the first Artemis launch attempt when an astonishing international contingent arrived at KSC. High-level officials from 25 countries from all over the world, a mix of current partners, future partners, and nations whose own ambitions in space won't even be realized for many years, but who understand what Artemis represents as a global endeavor and a symbol of international space diplomacy. Despite it being an insanely crazy time, as those of you who were there will remember, with the crush of traffic caused by hundreds of thousands of people clogging all the access routes, there was an incredible spirit of excitement, camaraderie, and shared purpose among these 25 countries. It was like a global launch party. When that first launch attempt ended in a scrub, it turned out that those officials, enthusiastic officials from two dozen nations, had spent a very long night in traffic on the bus. One of them was an influential new government minister from one of most, our most significant international partner nations, who didn't yet fully appreciate the value to his nation of space exploration and had never been to a launch. Needless to say, after several hours on the proverbial bus to nowhere in the middle of the night, there was some concern about what he would take away from his experience. After all, he had come all this way and he was going home empty-handed. It turned out that this government minister was deeply moved by the optimism and spirit of collaboration and cooperation that filled that bus that long night, and by the number and diversity of nations who traveled from very far away to be there. He left KSC beyond excited about this new era of exploration, the role his country would play, and the potential space has for being a force for good in the world. And since that night, there has been no bigger champion of the space cooperation between our two countries. So many nations want to be a part of this historic endeavor and are looking for ways to participate, large or small, wanting to incubate or grow their space sectors to take advantage of this new era of exploration and the opportunities that it affords them. NASA has always had the power to unite people and nations around a common purpose, to build bridges and strengthen ties and expand collaboration between countries, and now to stimulate industry-to-industry -industry collabor collaboration and ventures as well in support of mutual goals. Looking at our fairly recent history from developing cooperation with non-traditional partners under Charlie Bolden to ensuring Artemis would be a global endeavor like none other under Jim Bridenstein, and now to Bill Nelson who champions scientific discovery as a means of strengthening diplomacy. Appreciation for the importance of international cooperation to NASA's mission and to the nation has been strongly recognized and supported by NASA's leaders throughout the decades. And now we understand its importance to national goals better than ever. Those of us building and bolstering international relationships in space are creating the environment for commercial space activities to flourish. Building enthusiasm among stakeholders, stimulating investment, strengthening bilateral relations for key foreign policy partners, and ensuring nations around the world can contribute to building this future world in which they will take part. This is what we do. This is space diplomacy. 
and the result is a large, growing, maturing community of spacefaring nations and those who plan or just aspire to be willing to take a leadership role in defining how humanity is going to explore in innovative ways in low Earth orbit as it becomes a commercial market marketplace, on and around the moon, and in the future on Mars. This is what is needed to grow this global space economy, and we're building this future together. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That was a great, great introduction for our panel now. So have a seat, and then I'll ask the rest of our panel to join us here today. And today we have Deborah Factor, is the head of the US Space Systems at Airbus, US Space and Defense Incorporated. Mark Jokmich. Jokmich is the head of the Washington, D.C. office of the German uh, Aerospace Center, DLR. And Jay Kim is the chief executive officer and chairman of Bora Young. So, welcome. And we've asked Karen to uh, sit with us because we're going to, we'll have probably about 20 minutes of questions and so for our panelists, but then we're going to get into questions from the audience. So keep them coming in. I, I'm watching them all right here on me. They, they all look great. We could probably talk for about three hours on the questions. <laughs> but let's get started with uh, a little more about our panelists. So what I'd like to do first is um, have each of you talk a little bit about your role in the space industry, how you participate in the international marketplace, and are you primarily focused on government business, commercial, or a combination? And we'll just go right down the line and start with you, Jay. Yes, uh, I'm Jay Kim, um, CEO and Chairman of Boryong, and uh, we run Health uh, Humans and Health Initiative, which takes care of um, human health in space and on Earth. And we are a commercial company, but we work very closely with uh, our uh, space agency. Mark? Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Jochemich. I represent the German Aerospace Center, DLR, uh, here in the US uh, and, and Canada. And DLR is, uh, has two main capacities. We are the German Space Agency, uh, so implementing the uh, space policy strategy of the German government, representing Germany within the European Space Agency, and also towards the European Commission and their space endeavors. Um, work internationally, of course, with, with international partners like the US. And the other uh, capacity we have is we are the German Research Center for Space and Aeronautics. So uh, out of our total 11,000 employees, uh, the vast majority works in the research uh, domain of, of what they do. Okay, great. Deborah? I'm Deborah Factor. I run the U.S. space business for Airbus, U.S. Space and Defense. Uh, obviously, Airbus is an international company, and in the U.S., we operate uh, within a little bubble, I would say, for uh, the U.S. government business, national security. Uh, our business has military helicopters, military aircraft, intelligence business and space, and really the space focus is small satellites and also space exploration. A lot of collaboration that we do with Europe and particularly on some of the exploration programs with Artemis and um, uh, some satellite missions, as well as we now have a partnership with Starlab, a new joint venture that we formed this year. And the answer of do you work government, commercial, private, uh, military, the answer is yes. It's really, it's really all of them. And I think we'll explore today a little bit of how those links come together. Great. Okay, now get a few specific questions for each of you for Mark. Germany has been a longtime partner on the ISS and signed the Artemis Accords last year. How is DLR viewing the next decade of LEO exploration and preparing for post-ISS future at the same time? Yeah, thank you for this question. Yeah, Germany is uh, the biggest contributor in Europe to the ISS program, so within ESA. Um, so that shows our commitment to, to LEO uh, exploration. And, um, but we also work bilaterally with, with uh, not only through ESA but with, with international partners. We have important uh, missions and, and, and uh, experiments coming up with NASA, uh, um, with the Japanese Space Agency. So that is very important to us. 
And um, while we are fully committed to uh, use ISS to full extent until end of its lifetime, of course, we already uh, talk and work with the uh, providers of the commercial Leo destinations. Um, we considered very important that we will have a continuous and especially a no gap situation there that, that uh, we will be able to transfer smoothly and without interruptions from ISS to uh, any of the commercial Leo destinations. So interoperability and uh, transferability is, is key from our perspective. And uh, we are reconvinced that we will lead uh, Leo exploration uh, far beyond the lifetime of ISS, uh, not only for science that, that uh, I already mentioned, but also to develop uh, technologies for space exploration in general, uh, technologies and tools, because it's uh, much easier access in, in LEO to do those things before we venture further into space. Great. Deborah. Um, Jeff Faust wrote an article earlier this month titled, Commercial Space Stations Go International. In it was the headline, Starlab Recreates the ISS Partnership. Can you talk about the Starlab Space JV, how, how the Starlab Space JV is navigating an unknown international cooperation landscape post-ISS and some of the challenges you are facing beyond the obvious need for sustained funding? Are there lessons from the ISS partnership that are guiding the organization through this current phase of development? Well, I, I love Jeff and his articles, and I will say he really was very insightful and got, got that strategy right. Um, the Starlab joint venture led with uh, Voyager Space and Airbus and now has partnerships from, uh, from Mitsubishi in Japan, from MDA Space in Canada, Palantir on uh, the AI side, and it's exactly right, of bringing together the industrial representatives of the countries who have been uh, long involved in the space station. You know, personally, it reminds me earlier in my career, the transition from the, the Cold War and the plan originally for space station freedom, and then the shift to bring in new partners for what became International Space Station was, uh, and Karen, you, you brought up all the international diplomacy and the tool of foreign policy that the US used that brought all the countries together. And now with this shift to um, uh, commercialization with the space station retiring is having a plan going forward and saying what if we take an industrial model that replicates that because in the end the governments aren't building things industry is building things and now to say um, let's bring the best in breed across all of uh, the representative countries and more which the Artemis Accords is also facilitating so it's super, uh, super exciting and forward thinking and I think allows some of the, uh, you asked about the lessons learned, some of these frameworks, because the big question, how we operate in space right now, relies a lot on the government to government agreements and industry and even with commercial sides, we're very, um, uh, very much reliant on having a reliable and predictable, if you will, kind of stable um, governance in space. And now, as commercial kind of takes over this next level, how do we keep that going? How do we make sure that we keep uh, the right values and the expected behaviors, what to do when there's geopolitical conflicts? And there's obviously examples of that going on today, and space has manage to stay neutral. And I think that's really important as we shift and have industrial representatives um, having that same kind of behavior for the greater good uh, in space. So those are some of the things that, that we're looking at within the Starlab joint venture. I sit on the board representing uh, Airbus US. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot of things we think of uh, between now and the operations, and in the meantime, focus on getting the habitat module designed. Yeah, wow, it's, um, as you think about that going forward too, and you s now see a lot of the industry-industry collaborations, it's gonna be critical in the future for how does the industry-industry collaboration continue to inform and stay 
you know, with the governments. You know, how, how are those court, how are those discussions going to happen? How are people going to stay up to speed? Because they're going to be, you know, it's the government's going to lead in certain areas, but industry's going to go out here too. So the government's going to need to understand that. So I imagine that's uh, another interesting challenge, Karen, for as you guys go forward. <laughs> okay, Jay. It was big news to hear about a Korean pharmaceutical company investing in an American space company. Upon reading in the news, I and I believe a lot of other people have, have read about this news, were curious about how this international partnership came about. Could you share with us a bit more about the background behind this investment, especially on the relationship with you and, and how the relationship with you and CAM was formed? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question. Um, in essence, pharmaceutical uh, business is taking care of um, people's health. And then when we first started our Humans in Space Challenge three years ago, uh, we had zero exposure in space whatsoever. And we decided to start this initiative in the States. And that required us to be really different and provide very differentiated value to the participants to our um, challenge. So we figured that um, Providing an access to ISS would be a, a crucial differentiator. So we made a cold call to ISS uh, through Johnson Space Center, but um, having no exposure, no um, past experience dealing with space matters, uh, we didn't get any call back. So we were kind of <laughs> stuck in the middle, but our um, good partner back then, Starburst, um, informed us that there's a private company who's trying to build a private space station called Axiom. So then we were stunned to hear that there's a private company who's trying to build a space station. So we r flew right in to Houston, uh, meet with its CEO, Mike Safardini, and we were just thrilled to find out there's a company like this. And we made our first mes investment back then. And then, um, a few months later, uh, the company threw out uh, a little party in a launch party for the AX-1 mission. We went there, and uh, unfortunately, we couldn't see the launch because it was delayed, but I was able to meet with Kim, the founder and the chairman of the company, and we spoke, and uh, the commonality that we found between him and myself was that uh, us, humanity has to be multi-planetary. And he runs multiple organizations just like Elon Musk, and one of the organization he runs is a nonprofit called Limitless Space Institute. And uh, what that organization does is basically to inspire the next generation, inspire the students. And he has this three minute video, which is on YouTube, uh, dubbed Go Incre Incredibly Fast. You can find it on the YouTube. And it basically shows how we have to develop technology to go beyond our solar system. And I knew from my heart that we need to go off the planet to thrive as a civilization. And we agreed that that starts from LEO space station. So because it's the closest destination for humans in space. So we clicked and we made the second um, investment. Uh, we led their series C, I joined the board and we are just keep growing our partnership. Great, thank you for that story, that was great. Thank you. Okay, Mark, the GRACE mission have, missions have been a longstanding cooperation between Germany and the US. Germany in particular has been active in Earth observation for a long time. As the commercial Earth observation market has matured over that time frame, is DLR working to incorporate commercial data into its systems? Are there challenges to this type of collaboration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the GRACE missions are really uh, an excellent example for our bilateral cooperation with the U.S. So since uh, more than 15 years now, we uh, gather that data of our planet that, that's, that's invaluable for understanding climate change and, and the water cycle. And um, um, yeah, both our organizations, NASA and DLR, but also, of course, all the uh, scientific partners and, and the industrial partners, uh, um, Airbus building the satellite in, in satellites for, for those missions in Germany, um, are, are really excited that we're now working on the third mission within the Gray series, Gray C, 
uh, so we can ensure that there's continuity in this uh, uh, really important scientific um, data set that, that we're gathering. And um, I think those types of missions, like, like GRACE, they will continue to be uh, agency missions because with the GRACE data, it, it doesn't uh, hold potential for commercialization itself. Uh, so we will always have those big scientific Earth observation or other missions where, where um, we won't have a commercial actor stepping in and, and saying, well, that's what I want to do uh, because there's no way in selling those data. So uh, agencies like NASA, like DLR will continue to do that. But of course, there's, there's other open uh, accessible uh, Earth observation data which can be used to uh, to, to, turn, to be turned into a service and application. And that's certainly something that we do as a space agency. We support uh, this uh, data use along the value chain. And, and we organize user forums, for example, to bring together those companies that can do something with the data and the potential clients that, that often are, are agencies within the government or, or regional or even local administration that, that can, can make use of Earth observation data, for example. Um, we also plan, uh, we are right in the process of setting up a program to, to buy commercial Earth observation data that's not um, gathered by, by a government mission, but by commercial actors that have their own fleet of satellites in, in space. And we are planning to, to buy some of those data sets and then make it available to science, to researchers, um, and also make use of those kind of data for uh, humanitarian efforts, for example, to make use of it uh, within the uh, charter of major disasters where, where uh, we contribute as a, as, a, as a country and as an agency. And uh, this is, for example, an approach to on the one hand, foster the commercial earth observation industry in Germany with new companies coming up working on uh, fire detection and, and uh, agriculture uh, and things like that. And on the other hand, making this data available for a larger group of, of scientists and, and uh, end users free of charge because we, we're going to buy them and, and, and uh, provide them. Great, great collaboration. Um, for Jay, okay. Your Korea US partnership in the space industry is especially interesting given that it was just recent that the Korean Space Agency was formed and Korea was also not an ISS member country. How do you think this partnership between Boryang and Axiom affects and contributes to the partnership and space strategy at a national level for both the US and Korea? Yes. Um, so as Karen mentioned earlier, uh, we set up our own space agency three months ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are trying to be their go-to partner when it comes to doing anything in LEO. And that's why um, we established BRAX with Axiom in Korea um, to invigorate the researches that can be done um, in LEO. And since we didn't have an access to ISS because we couldn't join the program when it was becoming a reality because back then we had our own financial crisis. And um, the interesting thing that we found is that our one and only astronaut went to ISS in 2008. And ever since that we didn't um, have human space flight program. And what we are doing with Axiom these days is through our humans in space youth program in Korea, we are sending um, 20 of students' drawings to ISS next year uh, through AX4 mission. And what we found out is that it's the only um, Korean objects that will be inside of ISS in 17 years. Wow. So I think that kind of tells a lot about our role as a commercial company in partnership with CASA in um, accelerating innovation in LEO. Great, thank you. Okay, Mark and Deborah, as longtime leaders in the global space community, what geopolitical challenges do you see 
for international collaboration as we look beyond LEO. And this will lead into some of our questions, which will start next. You want me to start? So, you know, a lot of um, considerations come up from geopolitical, but also just uh, difference between industry and government and how we operate and what our business models are and the expectations. You know, concerns for industry, obviously, uh, looking at the whole funding and financial scenario, because it's a big shift from the government being a, an owner or an operator of, of hardware infrastructure and shifting over to industry. You have issues on the sharing of intellectual property, some of the rules that are on board the space station now, and the sharing of research. Mark, you were talking about making data accessible. Um, Industries want to protect their intellectual property and their know-how, so how, how that works. And uh, with today's, I, I would say from a policy standpoint, we always are considering the export and trade environment and the constraints that come in from that and what is driving them. Can we have sort of a, a free network in, in space? Is that an export free kind of environment? Once it goes up there, it's in a, a different kind of assumptions, adding in all the different uh, expectations from each government who might be involved from an industry standpoint, since it is industry oriented. You know, how does that shift? I don't know that we have answers to all of those uh, yet. And I mentioned earlier about behaviors and values um, of behaviors of, of people. I mean, in the end, it's people in space and how they interact with each other. People get in arguments uh, you know, in your own family or, or at work and you know, constructive conflict. What do you do in space? And particularly when politics goes into space, I think we all want to keep that out. Um, but how do you do that from an industry standpoint? Um, you know, looking at an example of commercial airlines right now when people just uh, get kicked off of flights because they, they get super upset. Uh, what are you going to do if something like that happens, happens in space? That's not necessarily a government, a geopolitical. It could be, but those kinds of, of situations which have long been a subject of long duration human space flight um, and, and what do we do? So now that you have industries doing that, I think there's a lot of lessons probably from commercial travel that can be looked at because these are, there's a lot of trade that goes on um, within other industries. The only difference is uh, it's not an immediately, you know, kick somebody off the, the space station or take them back, come back to the gate, uh, if, if you will. So maybe those are a few of the things to be thinking about. Um, the last thing I would add is in the original setup now is how we look at a global supply chain. So uh, each country likes to have the, the traditionally the dollars that it invests to go back into their own industry. And this is a key tenant of ESA with a geopolitical uh, return, certainly in the US with NASA. And at the same time, when you get down to industry implementing these uh, large, large hardware projects, the reality is we have a global supply chain. And there are certain considerations to have and how you balance of uh, you know, a buy American or ITAR free satellite. Um, what does that mean as we get into this international collaboration? Those relationships are really key in international collaboration of this large scale and making sure there's you know, a healthy supply chain from a lot of countries that uh, do what they do best and that we can incorporate those into not only something like Starlab, uh, but in addition to any other projects that we're doing in space, satellites, exploration, science, et cetera. Yeah, the supply chain issue, that's a really interesting one. Mark, any? Anything to add there? Yes, um, I totally agree. In, in, in uh, times like that, uh, with the geopolitical challenges, we really need to uh, work closer with like-minded countries and, and, and uh, uh, strengthen those, those uh, cooperation, uh, while not neglecting the multilateral fora, I think, uh, and Karen talked about it earlier, and, and that's why Germany actively uh, con continues to work actively 
on the UN level, especially uh, the Committee of Peaceful Use of Outer Space, which is really important to keep working there uh, and, and uh, use it as a platform for, for sustainable space exploration. Um, and uh, use other mechanisms like the Artemis Accord, uh, which uh, Germany signed last year, um, to uh, connect to like-minded countries to, to discuss, to use it as a, as this, uh, I really like this campfire analogy, to, as a, as a, as a uh, uh, place where we can openly discuss and, and talk about best practices. And, but then it's really important also to use this, uh, this results out of that and, the, the, um, and bring it back into, on, into the multilateral fora and that's why Germany, for example, coordinated one within the Artemis Accords signatory group one issue paper on how to make use of the discussions there and bring it into the forum of, of, of UN COPOS, for example. So that's really important. Um, also um, then spreading the words about uh, the Artemis Accords to m uh, make it even a larger group. So uh, early June we organized a workshop in, in Berlin where we invited uh, all the ESA, the European Space Agency member states that have not yet signed the Artemis Accords. For them a good opportunity to ask questions. Uh, maybe they have some um, considerations where they're not, not clearly understand what, what are the Artemis Accords about and that was a good opportunity for them to discuss. Uh, I think having those discussions is, is also really important uh, to, to better understand what we are trying to achieve there. And then um, of course also having, having uh, discussions with, with countries where we may have sometimes different perspectives. So um, mid-June, uh, uh, our Director General of the Space Agency, Walter Pelzer, participated, for example, in a UN uh, conference um, for lunar activities uh, where besides uh, Artemis Accords countries, also uh, countries uh, from the uh, ILRS uh, uh, were present and it I wasn't there, but I, I was told. I was told that it felt like all the participants had uh, could agree that uh, activities on the lunar surface should be on the on the uh, on the on the ground of, of, of existing space law and, of course, uh, being peaceful and sustainable. So, um, in principle, I think all those countries out there doing space exploration, especially uh, lunar. Uh, endeavors, they have a, a similar mindset, but, but, but maybe different approaches, how to communicate, how to approach this, and we need to keep this conversation going to make sure that we uh, really have sustainable exploration in the end. Great. Well, we have a number of very interesting questions. Um, China is a key theme in some of these questions, so um, I would like to... One question, and maybe Karen, you can help us a little bit. Can you compare and contrast the Artemis Accords and the China's, I guess it's called ILRS? International and then that'll, Research. that'll tee us up to the, the next question about can, can space um, help bridge the gap with China or will things, competition, exacerbate some of the other feelings? So if you could help us first with the compare and contrast the, the Accords, and then maybe we can all comment a little bit about um, what the future might, you know, how things could play out. Happy to. Um, and there are so many things uh, that I've heard in this discussion that um, uh, we could really weave together. Um, Mark mentioned this UN-hosted conference the day before the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space met in June. I represented the United States in that, and it was the first time that uh, we shared uh, a, a stage with uh, all of the actors who are most active um, in space, including China, Russia, and a number of the ILRS, International Lunar Research Station uh, signatories. And to listen to the open discussion amongst the panelists, uh, you would think that there is total alignment in views on how we should explore transparently and sustainably uh, at the moon and beyond. Um, 
I expected when uh, the new head of the Office of Outer Space Affairs had this vision of bringing together people to talk in the same room instead of in our respective camps, so to speak, that uh, China might make available the text of its mm -hmm. ILRS principles so that we could speak knowledgeably about um, those similarities and differences, uh, which did not occur. So I can speak to what we have all sort of read about them, uh, but I think it's an indicator that we're not yet there mm -hmm. uh, when one of the core uh, principles of the Artemis Accords is transparency and we don't really know what other nations are signing up uh, to in how they will implement their activities on the moon. That being said, I think you know imitation is the highest form of flattery. I, everything that we've heard over recent years, there are some tenants in there that are very similar. I consider that hugely a good thing. Yeah. Uh, we, we went down this path to set, uh, uh, to set an example for the world and invite them to join us in thinking through how we'll do what we will do. Um, and we, I hope we will get to more details on uh, other uh, approaches, as Mark called them, uh, to see where, where there are synergies and maybe where we can help others to think even more uh, deeply about some of the things that, that we care about most. Great. Any other comments from panelists? It's a, it's a, I know it's a little bit of a loaded question. It's a tough question, you know, because clearly there's a competitive aspect here and the transparency isn't where we want it to be and their, their capability is growing. So it's something that I think is on a lot of people's mind, which is reflected in the, the question. So, but I think all we can do is continue the conversations and try to, you know, like I said, I like the fact that we're getting the same sort of responses and, and the, it sounds like we're on the same page, but the proof is let's, let's really make sure we're on the same page, the trust but verify. Mm -hmm. um, a, a little bit along those lines, and I think this came up yesterday in um, the macro, I think Jonathan brought it up and we said, we were talking about U.S. leadership, and Jonathan said it needs to be U.S. and our allies' leadership. Mm -hmm. And then a question came in here, it says, um, international cooperation is vital to take steps um, toward world peace. Why then do we hear about how America must be the world leader in the space industry? And I liked it yesterday when Jonathan said it's America and its allies. So, you know, just how, how would you guys like to just react to that question? Because, you know, you represent other countries and Deborah, you work here, US, but you, you know, work in an international environment. So when you hear that, why do you hear, why must America be the leader? And, and maybe it's America is a leader because we're in a position where, with the technology and where we're at. But how do you react to that statement? So I would say um, from a leadership standpoint, I mean, the, the biggest area to lead is, is money and budget and the m amount that, that we proportionally spend and have historically spent on space. So it, it kind of goes with that. But I, it's changed significantly with, with the influx of uh, private capital and accessibility to space markets. We've seen growth in entrepreneurship in many countries uh, in, in Europe and Southeast Asia where previously the technologies and the, the capital really wasn't available. And I think that's been a huge game changer and thinking that um, it's not just the U.S. And, and frankly, as we've seen in these larger scale pro projects, and when you count the supply chain, nobody does it alone. So there really is no such thing as 100% done by one, one country or entity. Um, so that the, the partnerships with allies, I think today is even more important. I'm using an example, so the Artemis Accords with NASA, um, on the national security side with, with the Space Force and the concept of um, allied by design and really thinking of how national security missions collaborate and require communication with other countries and other capabilities. I think a lot of that started to come to play as space is such a critical component into uh, anything from, from airplanes to missiles to all the, the Earth observation data that's used or GPS. 
position navigation and timing. And uh, the, the first Gulf War, I think, showed that even communicating among allied nations or with NATO, nobody was using the same systems. I mean, still, probably, there's not a lot of, of common communication that causes some barriers. So thinking ahead, using the like-minded nations and some of the geopolitical challenges that we have, working together on increasingly global systems that have to interact together, you have the interoperability, and frankly, industry is already doing things like that, of collaborating across boundaries, and it's, you know, is the government going to catch up uh, sort of thing. And I, I think it's a, it is a collective future that it's not one country leading and t putting egos aside of what is the best way to continue our development in space and continuing to pioneer, and that will be global. Great. Any other comments on that about U.S. leadership? And yeah, maybe um, I see the clock ticking down and being a zero on a, maybe a very short comment. Um, definitely leadership goes, goes also with budget and, and market size and uh, the US space market is, is uh, really uh, uh, much bigger than the European markets or whatever. So it's really a big interest of, of uh, European and German industry to be part of this, uh, to access this market and, and be part of this. And, but leadership is not total dominance or something. So it can, it has to be cooperation as well. And uh, also um, approaches like, for example, the moon to Mars architecture approach, where, where you really transparently laid out the plan on how you want to proceed towards moon and Mars exploration in the, in the next decades and have uh, open up the uh, capability or the, the opportunity for international partners to weigh into this discussion and bring in their viewpoints and, and shape this architecture is also a way of leadership to, to be uh, transparent and open and cooperative. And that's, uh, I think, uh, in the end, it's beneficial for, for all the involved parties because uh, other countries have something to yeah. bring to the table that that's, that's, uh, will be really... Uh, worthwhile considering and, and implementing it. Great. Well, I think we're out of time. There's many, many more questions that I'll share with you guys because I think you'll be interested in seeing them. And I do appreciate the audience participating here and providing these. Um, I hope this has given you a little bit of insight into the bigger picture as we look at this from a worldview. Um, I certainly know I learned a lot of things from the, the panel just on how, where we're at with the state of our international collaboration, both for, from a government and industry side. So I'd encourage you to speak to our panelists later, and then to, we have some additional panels that are more internationally focused throughout the day. So now I think there's time to go get some coffee, and then we will start the program, and there's great programming here this morning, so I encourage you all to enjoy it. Thank you, and thanks to the panelists here. Thank you.